Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon, we focus on a new book by Jason Steinauer titled History Disrupted, How Social Media and the World Wide Web Have Changed the Past, published by Palgrave Macmillan last December. Joining us this afternoon as discussants are Catherine Kramer Burnell of Purdue University and Claire L. Lanier of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I'm Eric Arneson from the George Washington University, co-chair co of the Washington History Seminar, along with my colleague, Christian Osterman of the Woodrow Wilson Center. The Washington History Seminar is a collaborative venture of the Woodrow Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and the American Historical Association's National History Center. And for over the past decade, the seminar has been meeting weekly in pre-COVID times at the Wilson Center in person, and since the pandemic, well, here in the virtual realm. Behind the scenes, there are two people who make the seminars possible, Pete Bierstecker of the Wilson Center uh, and Rachel Wheatley of the National History Center. And I'd like to thank our institutional support of the George Washington University Department of History, as well as any number of anonymous individual donors. And as we say, every single week, we invite you to join their ranks. On the logistics front, please note today's session is being recorded and can soon be found on our institution's respective websites. When we get to the question and answer section of the webinar, we ask those of you with questions to use the raise hand function on Zoom. To those watching on Facebook Live, you can email questions to Rachel Wheatley at rwheatley at historians.org. You can also pose questions in the Q&A function, not chat, Q&A uh, on Zoom, and we will call on as many folks as we can. And with that, I turn over the screen to Christian Osterman, who will be moderating today's session. Christian, screen's yours. Thanks, Eric. Good to be back at the Washington History Seminar, and I'm really delighted to um, feature uh, one of our global fellows um, uh, uh, in this session, along with two distinguished panelists, commentators. Let me introduce um, Jason Steinhauer as our featured speaker first. Uh, Jason is, as mentioned, a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center. He's also a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute and a contributor to Time and CNN. He's a past editorial board member of the Washington Post's Made by History, directed by Katie Brunel. Um, he is also a former presidential counselor of the National World War II Museum and a former founding director of the LePage Center for History in the Public Interest, a longtime institutional sponsor of this seminar. In 2020, he founded the History Club on Clubhouse, which he hosts regularly. The club has more than 100,000 members and averages 2,500 listeners per week. In 2021, he created the first cryptocurrency devoted to history. Um, dollar sign Jason, I guess, the dollar sign Jason coin, um, which will be used to provide grants for public facing history projects. In 2014, he coined the term history communicators and has worked with colleagues worldwide to found the new field of history communication. And he is the founder of the History Communication Institute. He has twice traveled overseas with the US State Department as part of diplomatic exchanges between the United States and the European Union meeting with government officials, scholars, and students to discuss the effects of the web and social media on public understandings of news, history, and information. Jason, it's wonderful to have you um, here at, at the, Wilson, at the uh, Washington History Seminar uh, with your new book, History Disrupted, How Social Media and the World Wide Web Have Changed the Past. The Zoom Room is all yours. A warm welcome to the Washington History Seminar. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, it's awesome to be here. Uh, thanks to the Wilson Center for all of its support and hospitality and Christian, who's been a great friend and colleague for a few years now, and to Eric and the National History Center, who I've had a relationship with for many years now as well, dating back to my time at the Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. Uh, Dr. Catherine Brownell, who I know as Katie, has also been a co-collaborator and co-conspirator on many projects over the years, as has Claire. Um, so this is, I feel like I'm in esteemed company. I almost feel like I should let them speak as opposed to me. So I'll just try to be brief and talk about a little bit the book and 
why I wrote it and what it says, and then we can get into a conversation about it and hear from this esteemed panel of colleagues about uh, their thoughts on it and then get your thoughts on it as well to all of you who are out there watching in cyberspace at the moment or watching this later uh, in a recorded session. So um, the book, as mentioned, is this. It's called History Disrupted, How Social Media and the World Wide Web Have Changed the Past. It came out at the end of December 2021, so it's been out for about two months or so. But the book itself took me about five and a half years to write, and actually the idea for the book is even predates that. So why don't I talk a little bit about that, because that kind of tees up some of the ideas that are in the book. So uh, as I mentioned, I used to work at the Library of Congress, which is actually this image behind me. This is right next to where I used to work, and this was the room that we held lectures in LJ 119. And when I worked at the Library of Congress, my job was to bring scholars from around the library, uh, around the world, excuse me, to conduct research in the library's collections, and then to tell people about their research, whether it be members of Congress, congressional staff, folks at think tanks like the Wilson Center, other scholars, media, etc. So in the process of doing this work, uh, I met a scholar at the library named David Grinspoon. David Grinspoon is an astrobiologist, planetary scientist, and he's also what he terms, and others term, a science communicator. So he thinks about how scientific information gets communicated through various media and the most effective way to communicate through various media in order to affect public policy. So the more I learned about science communication, the more I thought to myself that history should do the same. There should be something called history communication. And we should train people to be history communicators. And we should do research and study and analyze how history gets communicated through various media in order to best affect public policy and public conversation. So I suggested this to a few people. Some people thought it was a great idea. Some people thought it was a terrible idea. But we managed to get a group of people together who were interested enough in this that we had sort of a summit, quote unquote, in 2016 at UMass Amherst, which was sponsored in part by Purdue University and by Katie. And Christian was there. And Dane Kennedy and National History Center were also involved in these conversations. And the idea was, if we were to do something called history communication, what would it look like? What skills would it encompass? What types of research would be needed to understand how communicating through all these various media affects history? We had a follow-up conversation at the Library of Congress in the summer of 2016, and we actually developed some coursework and some curriculum, which actually got taught at several universities. Uh, there's a history communication course at UMass Amherst that was taught by Mar Marla Miller. It's actually gonna be taught again next year as a graduate seminar. And there's actually now a history communication lab at Wayne State University being run by Jennifer Hart. There's also been history communication fellowships at the LePage Center. And you know, there's a lot of activity in this space now, which is really exciting. But the more I thought about this, the more I thought to myself that there was actually a larger story here and that this was the potential for a book project. And it seemed to me that there was so much rhetoric and discourse about how the web and social media have changed journalism, changed politics, even affected our public health, but no one had really written a book about how it's affected history and what we know about the past. So that's what I set out to do. Uh, I took notes on this and put draft together in 2015 and 2016. I pitched it to publishers. No one was interested. They told me no one read it. I put the project down for a little while as I moved cities and changed jobs and got married and bought a house. I picked it back up in 2019 when I wrote the first draft. I wrote the second draft in 2020, the third draft in 2021, and the book is here in 2022. Originally, this book was 80,000 words. It is published form, it's just about 50,000. So I took out a lot of stuff. I had stuff in here about science communication, I had stuff in here about the changes to the media landscape and journalism, much of which is going to show up in my newsletter because I have lots of great research on all those things. But for the purposes of this book, to tell a more cohesive story and actually to make it something people would want to read, I kind of trimmed it down and wrote it in a more journalistic style, which is Someone told me it reads like a Wired article, which I consider to be a compliment, but I think they meant it as an insult. Uh, so, so that's what the book is. The book examines how history gets communicated through the web and social media and what that is doing to understandings of the past. And I have to say that I went into this book somewhat optimistic and I left somewhat pessimistic after five and a half years of research and writing. 
And when you read the book, you will see that the conclusion is not all that rosy. In fact, the title of the last chapter is, Does History Have a Future? And so why did I sort of end up at this part of the spectrum? What has gone into this? Well, one of the questions I was trying to ask in the book and answer in the book was, why does some history content rise to the top of our news feeds? And why is there others that we never see? Right. So why are you encountering certain information about the past on Twitter, on Instagram, in the news media, on Wikipedia? And why is there some other historical information that never reaches your eyes? And the more I researched and the more I thought about it, the more I realized that the answer to this question had nothing to do with the accuracy of the information, it had nothing to do with the veracity of the information, it had nothing to do with the rigor and sophistication of the information, it had nothing to do with how well researched the information was. What I realized and what I argue in the book is that information online about history, especially on social media and the web, comes to our attention when it aligns to a certain set of conditions. And if it doesn't align to that set of conditions, then you're less likely to see it or you'll never see it at all. And so it doesn't matter if the content is created by a journalist, a historian, or a teenager in Australia, if it aligns to a certain set of conditions, you're more likely to see it than not. So what are those conditions? Well, probably the most important chapter in the book is chapter two. And chapter two sets out what I argue is sort of a contrast or a conflict of values. I argue in chapter two and in this book more broadly that history as a profession, as the way it's practiced, is an expert-centric, always evolving intellectual pursuit that is time-consuming to produce and intrinsically valuable. Time-consuming, it takes years to write a book, months or years to produce an article. It's an always evolving intellectual argument, right? His work constantly in this dialogue with each other about the scholarship. We say one thing, we build on it, we say another. It's expert centric, so experts are at the center of communicative power and it's intrinsically valuable. In other words, history is assumed to be valuable just because it's valuable. It's important to know something about history, even if we can't always articulate why that is. Well, I argue that the social web, the way it's been designed is actually user centric, a data-driven commercial enterprise, instantly gratifying and extrinsically valuable. In other words, what's valuable online is really just comes down to how many clicks, views, and shares it can gather, right? How many transactions it can muster up? Because the more transactions you muster up, the more valuable something becomes on the internet. Uh, my history club has 100,000 members. That makes it valuable. If it had five members, it would be less valuable, even if the information was exactly the same. So, I argue in the book that transposing professional history into the social web is taking an expert-centric, always evolving intellectual pursuit that is time-consuming and intrinsically valuable and putting it into an ecosystem that is user-centric, data-driven, commercially driven, instantly gratifying, and extrinsically valuable. So it's essentially like putting a square peg into a round hole. And I argue, at least this is what my research showed, that the more likely the content aligns to the user-centric, data-driven, instantly gratifying, extrinsically valuable, the more likely you are to see it. And the more aligns to expert-centric, expert always evolving intellectual pursuit that is time-consuming and extrinsically valuable, the less likely you are to see it. So at the end of the book, my conclusion is that actually all this history online doesn't really improve understandings of the past all that much among non-experts who rely on the web for information, what it does is it further embeds the values of the social web deeper into our lives. And I'm not convinced that's actually a good thing, the more I've looked into it. So it's a kind of a crazy book in that respect, because this is surprised, like this all surprised me. I did not expect to find this going into it. And it took me a lot of time and a lot of effort to sort all this out, as you can imagine, because the web is a big place and there's lots of history on the web. It's actually one of the largest content categories on the web. And this is not a book that looks at, you know, individual examples of particular historical information and kind of evaluates it for how many views and clicks and shares it got. Uh, it's really a book looking at the mechanisms behind the scene that are surfacing this content to us and making it visible. And by understanding some of those mechanisms, I feel like we can ask better questions, not only better questions about the content we see that are sort of media literacy and historical literacy based, but also better questions about this whole ecosystem that we're operating in and whether this is a good thing or not, or whether we should try to design a different ecosystem that privileges different sets of incentives. And that's kind of one of the things I've been talking about as I do these talks is 
do we really think this is a good ecosystem that we've all collectively created, this social media ecosystem that we operate in that includes history, but also includes other things? Does it reward the right types of behavior? In other words, it rewards virality and the ability to get transactions and clicks and views, but does it reward accuracy? Does it reward expertise? And if we don't feel like it does, then should it? And if it should, how would we design something different? So that's kind of one of the things that I feel like is the next step in this process of thinking about history communication. And it's one of the reasons why uh, we've created the History Communication Institute, which is a very, very new thing. It's only a couple of months old, still getting off the ground. But the idea for the HCI is to create a space for this conversation and also to experiment and uh, try different ways of doing history communication as the web continues to evolve from web 2.0 to web 3.0, and also to have historians in dialogue with content creators and web designers and product developers to think about designing better incentives for the web uh, that's coming down the pike as opposed to the incentives for the web that we currently have. Now, the last thing that's probably important to mention is I'm a big fan of coining terms, as you know. And so in this book, I coined another term and the term is e-history, okay? So the, the sort of, uh, the more I looked into this, the more I thought about all these ways that we communicate history, whether it be on Twitter or Instagram or Wikipedia or whatever, I kind of felt like it needed a new name because again, it sort of all aligns with these various conditions. And it's sort of a different way of transacting in historical knowledge than I feel like has come before it. So in the same way we have books and eBooks, in the same way we have commerce and e-commerce, I'm suggesting this book that we have history and we have e-history. And so I actually have a definition of e-history in the book, which is actually on the very first page of the book. And uh, I sort of use that terminology throughout the book, talking about these various mechanisms and various types of history content that we see online or we don't see online. And the thing about e-history, of course, is that it can be created by anybody. It can be created by professional historians, but it can also be created by journalists or history enthusiasts or teenagers in Australia who happen to be really good at sending content viral on Twitter. But again, the more it aligns with a certain set of conditions, the more it aligns with the values of the social web, the more likely you are to see it, I argue, in the book. So that's kind of the nuts and bolts of it. There's a lot more in there. Um, I'm pleased to say that all the people who told me that no one re would read this book are wrong because it's already a bestseller on Amazon, which is really exciting. And I think that speaks to the fact that the book intersects with a lot of interest areas, right? It, it's been interesting to people in tech to read this. Journalists have read it. Academics and scholars have read it. Um, Diplomatic Corps has been reading it. So I think the book is timely in that it touches on a lot of things that people care about. And I hope that it can be used to spark these types of interdisciplinary conversations among people who are interested in this subject and also care about a better social web and a better future for the web than the past 20 years of the web have shown us. So I'll stop there and I'm excited to hear what uh, Katie and Claire think and then I'm happy to take any questions. So am I, thank you, uh, Jason. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Catherine Kramer Brownell. Uh, she's an associate professor of history at Purdue University and an editor of uh, Mate by History at the Washington Post, an incredible service to the profession and the public. Um, so thank you, thank you, Katie. Um, her research and teaching focuses on the intersections between media, politics, and popular culture with a particular emphasis on the American presidency. Katie, warm welcome to the Washington History Seminar. The Zoom room is all yours and feel free to engage Jason at the end of your comments with some questions and we'll give Jason an, you know, a chance to respond immediately before we then turn to Claire. Wonderful, thank you so much for having me. And <laughs> I apologize in advance that I have terrible allergies right now. So I have a very scratchy voice and um, please bear with me uh, because there is really uh, great material to discuss in Jason's book, but it's a, a pleasure to be here and congratulations to Jason on the publication of a really important book that helps us understand the media landscape of the 21st century. And in particular, the many worlds of social media from Instagram to Twitter to Clubhouse, something that I just learned about last summer as well. And he even introduces some of the new worlds of technology that, that are coming um, and maybe shaping the future as well. 
I've talked with Jason for years now about the importance of bridging this academic and public divide with more effective communication tactics. And we have spent hours <laughs> discussing um, the benefits that come from thinking differently about the delivery of scholarship and making public engagement a priority for academics and what has to, what types of support resources and incentives need to be built into academic institutions to do this. And indeed, I'm not alone. Um, as the book highlights, there are so many incredible historians um, who are experimenting with new technology and new mediums to make their work accessible. And in fact, they've been doing so for decades. And certainly the book does a really terrific job um, of highlighting the challenges um, that they face today and that they have faced. And I really liked how he drew out the conflict uh, between the values of professional historians with the focus on expertise and rigorous research that takes time and the values of what he calls e-history, which becomes about sparking contagion and generating controversy, gaining, quote, influence, credibility and authoritarianness, as well as advancing agenda through those tactics. And I really like how he emphasizes the consequences of getting noticed over getting the facts right and getting the history right. Um, and it encourages media literacy. And I think that's one of the most exciting things about this book and something that I hammer home every time I have an opportunity in my classes, in public conversations, the importance of media literacy. It's something we desperately need. Uh, thinking about sources, perspectives, and agendas of those uh, shaping public conversations, invoking history and using it, frequently misusing it um, for ideological or perhaps even dangerous purposes. And so what I wanted to do today is to raise a couple points of discussion as a professional historian uh, who is firmly rooted in academia, but also has one foot in this media world uh, through my work as an editor of Made by History um, I see public facing history um, every day, I'm actively engaged in shaping it. And um, I also recognize some of the challenges um, that professional historians um, face, some of the very challenges that he outlines in the book itself. So I wanna raise a couple points for discussion. First uh, is the, the argument that Jason makes um, that quote, E-history's values and mores have changed the definition of history right before our eyes. And I think that's a really interesting argument to make. And, and he really does situate that there is this conflict between you know, professional historians and what they do, and then what, what shapes public perceptions of history, particularly um, this e-history that's happening in social media, kind of showing that they're, in, they're oppositional to one another, that they're in conflict with one another. And, and to, to, I, I want to push Jason on this a little bit more um, because this idea that e-history's values and mores have changed the definition of history before our eyes, my question would be is whose definition? Because yes, certainly amateur historians have gained more visibility um, on the web, something that comes out so clearly in the book. But is this actually happening with professional historians um, and particularly publicly engaged historians. And I, I don't know, I, I, I would push back on that because I think that the core elements of historical training, doing research, engaging, engaging in historiography to advance knowledge are still very much there um, in the public engagement work that professional historians are doing. Twitter is a great example. Um, and he spent some time talking about Twitter in the book. Um, and he, um, Jason points to Twitter threads as kind of tapping into this conflict or a particular news cycle to gain re relevance and visibility for the individual Twitter historian. But I, I would push Jason on the usage of Twitter by historians because sure, some are absolutely designed to, um, to present hot takes uh, that are just about attracting attention, um, just trying to go viral by stoking controversy. But so many of the really effective Twitter threads um, by historians are not about encouraging conflict. They might be tapping into a particular issue to meet people where they are, but and that they're interested in this issue, so they may read a particular thread. But threads 
are presented um, with evidence. Uh, they build an argument. They actually show history at work. There are threads that link to primary sources and that even engage with historiography and point and try to build this narrative the same way that you would do in a research article or a book. And I think that they show the accessibility and the eagerness of professional historians to navigate the social media world and make historical thinking and the historical process more visible and accessible. I, I would argue that they bridge the public and academic divide rather than perpetuate it. And that brings me to my second point, um, is that I think historian or Jason's argument about historians demonstrating history's intrinsic values to society um, is a really important point um, that, uh, that he comes back to at a variety of points, um, uh, or sections in the book, um, and really emphasizes that this is what historians do when they're making the case for history to the broader public. They're making a case about the social value of their discipline. Um, and I think absolutely that is really significant. Um, that is what they're doing. And that given the challenge of budget cuts and enrollments, this is really important work. Um, it's one of the reasons why I always encourage uh, scholars to write op-eds and to take public engagement seriously. But I also think that that overlooks something that is at the core of what historians do. Um, and that, that includes myself and how we see our work. And that is that we are scholars, um, but in being scholars, we're also educators. And that's one of the things that internet and social media or e-history, as Jason calls it, that's allowed us as professional historians, as educators, to rethink the classroom and expand the boundaries of the classroom. Uh, tapping into the newsworthy past or developing a podcast is beneficial um, professionally. And J Jason spends a lot of time in the book kind of talking um, about kind of these individual professional benefits, that it can raise the profile. Um, it's good PR, if you will, for your work. Um, and of course, it can promote one's work, it can help secure grants, and it can achieve visibility and influence, all the things that Jason Player documents in the book. But it also allows historians um, to educate more people. And can this help with careers? Of course. But I know that I dedicate so much of my time to doing public engagement work because I believe in making the classroom as open and accessible as possible. I, I see it as an extension of my research and teaching. Um, and I also firmly see that scholarship that is rooted in careful historical analysis and rigorous re research can actually help us solve the pressing social issues that we face today. Um, and so e-history has allowed more people. Um, this is something we've noticed, especially through Made by History. It's allowed scholars who are at um, smaller colleges, community colleges, small liberal arts colleges that didn't necessarily have access to a broader public. Um, women, scholars of color, it allows them an opportunity to shape the public conversation. So in short, I, the decentralizing impulses of e-history are not merely commercially driven which uh, really seems to be the focus of so much of Jason's book. And that is certainly our goal with Made by History. Um, and I would add one final point as an editor, uh, that there is one section that I would push back on Jason's argument about how editors determine the value of history. Um, because yes, we absolutely pay attention to the news cycle, but we also pay attention to scholarly rigor and the importance of history. And I think perhaps that's the unique aspect of what Made by History can do because we are run by professional historians who see the value um, of really new and exciting research. And yes, we are shaped, you know, we are bound in some capacities by the news section or the, the news cycle because we're part of a news um, section of the post. But we also have an opportunity to, to really foreground and draw attention to scholarship that may not um, get uh, that may not necessarily be linked to that news cycle that day. Uh, for example, we had a Black History Month series that was not necessarily connected to a specific news cycle, but an opportunity to publish and draw attention to exciting scholarship that's happening. Um, and there's there's a line in there where where Jason argues that um, circulation matters more than being um, factually correct. Um, and I would also say that given my work with the Post. Uh, the emphasis has always been uh, in our section, but across the, the news section has been on being accurate and factual. 
Um, I don't think that eyeballs matter more than accuracy. Um, we correct all errors and make it clear that we did. Um, and this is the expectation. And uh, the, the copy editors that I've worked with at The Post are incredibly diligent in making sure that we don't sacrifice factual um, um, or the integrity of the piece and the fact and accuracy just to try to get a catchier headline um, or to try to get that circulation. And I would end by saying that, jumping to Jason's final chapter, where he talks about, does history have a future? And I think it does have a future. And he makes a really important uh, point about history education being needing to be more user-centric and exciting. And that's exactly what is happening. Uh, I see it daily in classrooms uh, across Purdue and with my colleagues who are sharing their lesson plans in which they have students act out legislative debates or political conventions. They have them write op-eds and develop podcasts. And so I think curriculum is changing in really exciting ways to, to continue to make, make history accessible, but also to teach graduate students um, to integrate some of these these skills into graduate training to prepare them for a variety of different careers um, and to think about all of the, the, the different skill sets um, that they will need. Um, and that's why I think some of the, the, the institutional and curricular developments that have happened over the, the past five to 10 years are really significant and need to continue moving forward um, because we do need to continue to value um, and support public facing work. Uh, we do need to rethink um, curriculum and how we train graduate students to prepare um, for a, a range of careers so that they can go into nonprofits or business or um, uh, um, media worlds uh, with the skills of a PhD, with the, that, those critical skills and, and be able to apply the, the best practices of history to a variety of different fields. And I know the American Historical Association is doing such wonderful work in their career diversity program. And, and I looked it up and I thought I would just end by highlighting the five skills that the AHA career diversity program has really highlighted that professors do, but we need to really foreground in our graduate training to, to, make, more, uh, to make more historians um, focused on their contributions to the, the broader public and on so many different fields. And uh, they highlight the five skills of communication, collaboration, quantitative literacy, intellectual self-confidence, and digital literacy. And so I think the solution to some of the commercial challenges and impulses shaping e-history that Jason highlights here is to continue this work and how we're training our PhD students, how we're training our master's students, how we're training our undergraduate students to think about history and have more resources to support and encourage faculty to pursue public engagement and value it in meaningful ways. I, I know that Purdue has, as a land grant school says that they value teaching research and engagement all equally, but I think we really need to make that happen. Um, so because they are all equally valuable and they all do reinforce one another. So thank you to Jason for a great book to provoke a lot of these conversations. Thank you, Katie. Um, great comment. I want to give Jason a chance to respond to Katie's two or three questions. Um, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Katie. Thanks for reading the book, first of all. I appreciate it. Uh, I suspected that this book would kind of, you know, arouse some reaction from professional historians. Uh, so, you know, I I'm not surprised that there are elements of the book that people want to push back on or want to argue about. Uh, that's great. That's part of the process. This is why we need history communication and we need a history communication institute because there is really no place to have this type of discussion about history communication on a continual basis. It certainly happens at the AHA once a year or it happens at the NCPH once a year, but the vision for the history communication institute is to have a home for this type of conversation more ongoing. And in fact, we're doing monthly happy hours uh, to do to sort of start to build that community where we can ask these questions. I think this also, though, points to the point that we need more research, right? Because so much of this is anecdotal. And that's one of the things that I find when people talk about media and social media in, and the web is that we rely on anecdotes. We see a very small part of the puzzle on social media where we operate. And in fact, I think we oftentimes overestimate and how much we see and underestimate how small our corner of the social media universe actually is. So one of the reasons why it took five and a half years to write this book is because this book relies on some anecdotes, certainly, but it takes a much more comprehensive picture than anything that I've ever seen when it comes to this topic. 
And again, there's been stuff out there about history blogging and there's been stuff about history Twitter, but the expansiveness of this book is beyond, I think, what is currently out there. And this is why we need more research, because we actually need to study the efficacy of these things in a systematic data-driven way and not solely rely on anecdotes. And the reason I bring that up is because I have heard a lot of historians talk about Twitter and this belief that Twitter is this really efficacious way to bridge divides and expand certain types of education, which I agree with you, historians at heart are educators. But I have a lot of evidence, some of which is in this book and some of which will be in my newsletter because I ended up taking it out for a lot of reasons that actually Twitter is operating very differently than how some historians see it and think about it. And I think that's important, right? We have to sort of gauge these things based on data and research because we could all find an individual anecdote where we say, well, this particular person on Twitter did X, Y, Z, and it went X, Y, Z far, and it, it, it you know, contributed to X, Y, Z conversation. But that one anecdote isn't the whole picture, right? So one thing that's interesting, which I'll put out in my newsletter at a certain point later this year, is that if you look actually at a wider swath of historians on, on Twitter, Twitter historians, right, you actually see that a lot of the follower accounts are going down, not up. And that's kind of counterintuitive to what we might think. But it is kind of indicative, I think, of some of these larger trends, right? Things get caught up in the news cycle. They become uh, newsworthy. It becomes a newsworthy past for a week or two weeks or a month when something's in the news. And then people move on and they lose interest. And so is there sustained interest in those Twitter threads? Are those Twitter threads actually educating people, to your point, or are they just being used as part of these partisan fights that are happening online? And I think that's a really important question, because if we are thinking about history educa educational exercise, we need to actually see if these media and if, if these forms of history communication are having educational results. And I think the jury is still out on that in a lot of ways. And I would like to see more research and data on that to support some of these arguments that we're making back and forth about these things. And the same is true for Instagram, which I know Claire is an expert at. I'm not an expert at Instagram, but one of the really interesting things I found when researching this book is how little evidence there is to show that Instagram has any efficacy as an educational platform. Like there just isn't any evidence to support that argument. So we could find an anecdote of one or two people who maybe have used Instagram for an educational purpose and maybe they had some success and maybe they gained some traction. But the overall picture, what is it showing? How efficacious are all these platforms for doing that sort of education that is so critical to what historians wanna do? And I think those are very open questions. And based on the five and a half research that I, years of research that I did, I wasn't finding a lot of evidence to support that. And I've, I talk about all that in the book, and I'm going to put more about it in my newsletter. The last thing I'll just say is that I think also sometimes academic historians see the history landscape through a much narrower lens because they don't take into account the wide swath of public historians who are out there, right? There's 20,000 plus history organizations out there in the United States. And I have been fortunate to work a lot with the American Association for State and Local History and the National Council on Public History and the Society for Historians in the Federal Government. And for historians inside academic institutions who have tenure and can take time to do experimental things in the classroom, it's a little bit different picture than the public historians who are out in the field who maybe are running institutions on a shoestring budget, shoestring budget don't have job security, uh, are working for very low wages, and are also trying to find ways to use these tools, implement these tools, try to figure out these tools are effective, and the stakes are so much higher because their situations are so much more precarious. And I tried to take all that into account when I wrote this book, not solely look at it from the academic historian lens. And again, this book is not really about individual examples of people and trying to say how well or how poorly certain elements are doing in the history communication landscape. It's really more about looking at the mechanisms behind the scene and the whole infrastructure. And unfortunately for us, the web as an infrastructure is commercially based. Google, Twitter, Facebook, these are all for-profit companies. Every time you post something on there, you are giving them data that they then use to leverage to keep more people on the platform and sell more ads and make more money. So even if you're doing something with educational intent, you're contributing to a commercially driven infrastructure. And I think that's also something that we in history communication need to think about. How much do we want to be involved in that infrastructure? How much is that overall infrastructure benefiting society 
even if we can find one or two examples where it's benefiting individual historians. So I think that these are open questions, right? The book talks about this at several points, that this is an invitation to do more of this type of work and study, to ask harder questions about all this stuff and try to figure out what is going on on a systemic level. So uh, I'm excited to have these types of conversations. This is what I think needs to happen. And hopefully this book and these types of dialogues can start to open up those lanes of exploration. Thank you, Jason. Katie, immediate rejoinder or are you good for the moment? You're good? All right. Let me, before I introduce uh, Claire Lanier, um, just remind our audience that um, we'd like to uh, bring you in the conversation as well. Um, you can do so in three ways. Our preferred way is to bring you in uh, semi-life as uh, at least um, uh, by by using by your using the raise hand function and we'll call on you to mute yourself and uh, you can pose your question to uh, our panelists. Uh, you can also use the Q and A uh, function uh, in my case at the top of the screen to uh, uh, post your question and I'll, I'll put it to our uh, panelists. Or as Eric mentioned, you can email. Uh, Rachel Wheatley at rweekly at historians.org if you're following us on, on Facebook Live. Um, with that, it gives me great pleasure, um, since we've already talked a lot about social media, to talk one of uh, the real wizards in this field on this, uh, Claire Lanier. She is the Senior Manager for Social Media at the Metropolitan Museum of Art leading content strategy and development for more than 10 million followers across the Met's channels, the second most followed museum in the world. Over the last 10 years, she has managed social and digital communications for cultural organizations in Denver, Colorado, and New York City, including the New York Historical Society, History, History Colorado, Rocky Mountain, PBS, and the Wings Over the Rockies Air and Space Museum. She has an MA in Media Studies from the New School and a BA in Historic Preservation from the University of Mary Washington. In 2015, she produced the, webs, uh, the web series Claire's Clues to educate young people about historic sites. In 2016, she co-produced the viral Twitter campaign um, hashtag Museum Snowball Fight for which she was awarded a news award from the American Alliance of museums. In 2020, she was featured in Artnet News and the Art Newspaper. Claire, welcome to the uh, Washington History Seminar. I'm so glad you're here. The Zoom room is all yours. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, Jason, for, um, for writing this great book and creating this great discussion. And um, thanks for inviting me to participate. And also, Katie, I'm so excited to meet you. And I'm just, I've just been you just ruined all of my notes. You know, everything is um, a flurry now that I've been hearing you guys talk. Um, so I guess first I'll just say I'm coming at this um, from the perspective, not of a scholar or a historian. I am probably just an actual arbiter of e-history. So I felt deeply attacked by the whole book for sure. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but I, I really am coming at, from this from a different perspective. Um, and it was really fascinating to um, kind of dig into a lot of your points. So forgive me if I won't be particularly organized or articulate, I've just got so many questions um, spewing and I just sort of wanna um, speak a little bit about some of those questions and sort of the path that they're leading me down. Um, and Jason, you can sort of choose which one of those you wanna dig into a little bit. Um, I, I think one of, the, one of the resounding things that you talk a lot about in the book is this notion of expertise and who is talking about history and in what space and who's qualified to do that. And, um, you know, I immediately turned to myself uh, as I have no expertise in this other than that uh, literally when I was 25, <clears throat> excuse me, at History Colorado, I was an admin and someone said, hey, you're young. You can string together a couple sentences. You, that's it. That was basically my only qualification to start running museum social media. And I think that's probably true for a lot of cultural institutions and, and brands by extension. Um, it's such a young field. Um, it's, I guess, Facebook was invented in 2003. So we're, we're, we're barely at the 20 year mark. Um, so I think it's interesting to think about who is putting this content out there and what authorizes them. And I, I suppose that was one of 
my really big questions of the book is what counts as expertise? Um, does, you know, um, when we look at, do you have to have a PhD to be able to talk about history on social media? Do you, um, does my master's in, in media qualify me for anything to be talking about this in this space? I'm speaking on behalf of the Met. I'm speaking on behalf of, you know, I'm lucky my name is not attached to anything. I've got the power of the Met's logo. I've got a 150 year old institution behind all the content that I'm putting together, but really I'm just someone functioning as a vehicle for scholars. Um, and so is that, um, is that appropriate? And then talking about, you know, the, teenager in Australia who's posting TikToks, I think one of the really exciting things that we saw during the pandemic was an explosion of all of these digital spaces. And what's cool about TikTok in particular, I think, um, is that it prizes niche. And so there's a lot, and, and by extension, a lot of other spaces have done that as well. And so there are people who um, may or may not be academically authorized to speak on something, but do have a great wealth of knowledge. And so what's the value in that and how if we have no system for authorizing people for creating a standard of this information, what does what does qualify someone? Um, I know there's a textile conservator at the Met who has a viral um, TikTok account. Um, and so how much does that matter? Um, and that brings to a larger question as well that Katie touched on a little bit, which is which is really to push against that notion that expertise, academic expertise is the qualifier um, and, or, or that um, traditional methods within the academy um, are, are the most important. I think that something that I have not created, uh, I did not invent the phrase that social media is democratizing, but I do think that's a really significant part of it. And we've seen that um, it's done so much work in fields of activism um, in particular um, in kind of disseminating information and, and, um, viral videos and of police violence and things like that. So there's been a lot of benefits in that aggregate. Um, and it affords people who may not be able to get published, um, particularly women and women of color. Um, they're, they're able to control their message. Um, historians I'm thinking about in particular, um, Brittany Cooper does an incredible job on her Instagram of creating spaces of nuance, of utilizing Instagram live or videos to have really nitty gritty conversations. So I think it's interesting to think about while the, this, the, the tiny spaces of social media are limiting, it is interesting to look at those individual, we we're just talking about that this book doesn't necessarily look at individual accounts of where these things are happening. But I do think it's useful, and to your point about data, it would be great to have a larger study of where are we seeing this being effective? Um, I think it's also interesting thinking, to think about how big something becomes. As soon as something becomes big on the internet, does it, does it invalidate it a little bit? The Met has 4 million followers on Instagram, and so it can be challenging on any given post to have a worthwhile conversation um, without trolls coming in, without bots and spam. So how do we manage scale from an academic standpoint, um, whereas much smaller educational accounts can really flourish and have those conversations? It's the, you know, uh, it's just the social part of social media. If you're just putting out content, it's not really doing the work of that platform. So I think that's useful to think about um, in terms of storytelling um, and, and how it gives power um, to other people. Um, and, and I guess that is the question is that must history be gate kept, you know, mu must, what is the line between sort of harmless frivolity that you talk a lot of in one of your chapters about this notion of like, on this day content, you know, this notion, this um, idea of, of instant nostalgia. Um, maybe what, you know, to, to flip that on its head, like what is the d damaging harm to that? If you're looking at a casual, a, a, an amateur um, historian or someone who just, just wants to learn a little bit. Um, I, we, we see the really profound negative impacts of misinformation that you go into a lot um, in your discussion. But I think there's like, you know, it's easy to say, here's how Facebook completely destroyed an election on one end. What's the, what's the gray area of, um, enjoyment, entertainment, and, and what that brings to people um, intellectually. Um, so I think that's another thing that, that was brought up a lot that I was really interested in. Um, from the perspective of, of an educational institution, we're also in that bind kind of constantly. Um, someone I proposed like two years ago, um, what, you know, what would it, the, 
what would it look like if the Met started a TikTok and someone told me, oh, that would be pretty like, okay, boomer, right? You know, so we, we feel comfortable seeing, sometimes we don't feel comfortable seeing scholarly institutions engage in these types of spaces. At the same time, scholars and these institutions are maligned for, for being too highbrow, for being in the ivory tower. So what is that middle ground? Can the Met make a TikTok? And you know, when you look at it internally, um, when we do that and we think about it from an access standpoint of saying, you know, there are plenty of people who live down the block from the Met in New York City who've never even been there, who thought, who thought that it's not a place for them. Um, how do we bring in those people? And that's sort of been the focus of my career is how do we bring in people? How do we distill this information without dumbing it down, without creating a sense that this, this singular Instagram post is comprehensive to this topic? And I think that's where the challenge comes in with a lot of history communicators is, is, um, is how to not be comprehensive and how to feel okay with um, a lack of nuance and in, in allowing it to be intellectually stimulating um, just in and of itself. Um, I think uh, I, I think that um, brings a lot of questions to me in terms of the future of, of these spaces. And um, that's a big question that you leave at the end and that we've talked about a little bit about is sort of, you know, is history distillable? Is there, is there a space for um, history and scholarship within all of these channels? Um, is it even useful to have a Twitter thread about something? Does it provide anything? Um, there's a lot of ways we can look at different mediums and how they've done this. You know, uh, a whole mess of people never had heard of the Tulsa massacre until they watched Watchmen. Was that doing a disservice to the study of that? Or was that opening wider access to that and encouraging people to go learn more? So I'm sure, you know, we can, we can also find historically where people rejected this notion of uh, history, nonfiction films and TV and as well. So is, is this just medium based? Is this, this, our, this the technology of the moment that we're saying it's not doing what we want it to do? Um, and I had this thought about the metaverse, you know, or is it, can we visit the Battle of Gettysburg? Um, or we can, can we go hear um, the Gettysburg Address, you know, in a simulated experience? Is there value in that? Is that, and history museums in particular in the last 20 years have been kind of um, maligned for creating being amusement parks and, and, you know, creating interactive experiences, but like, is immersion useful? Um, and I think it's easy to argue that immersion is useful. And that brings me to the thought of emotion and, and why, why is emotion at odds with scholarship? I think that you talk a little bit about that in the book about nostalgia and the impact of that. And I think even one, at one point referred to nostalgia as the antithesis of historical study, but where, where, where are some of these things okay to exist and where are they not okay to exist? And I think that's kind of what I'm sort of sorting through. And, and a, lot of, a lot of what your book talks about are, are these questions of, there, are, there isn't an answer to that yet. Um, so, so we don't know what that's gonna look like. Um, and I guess I'll just end with thinking about, um, maybe some of this is just about viewing intention differently. Um, so if we've decided that Instagram is just not a worthwhile place to talk about a heady topic, maybe it's, it's restructuring how we're using them. These, to your point that you make very early on, I mean, these platforms are about advertising and marketing. They are money makers. If you haven't watched the documentary, The Social Dilemma, you know, it. Uh, I have no faith in Facebook and Instagram and Twitter to be good stewards of education. Or, um, so, but is invisibility the right method for that as well? If this is where these conversations are happening. So maybe it's simply about restructuring. Well, when we think about it as, as institutions, maybe we are just using this for advertising, for marketing, and we're rethinking all of our other digital um, spaces. We're rethinking our website. Blogs kind of died out um, in uh, maybe 10 years ago. Maybe that's a space we need to all reinvest in. Maybe we do need to be thinking more journalistically about the content editorially that we're putting on our websites and restructuring the social media spaces themselves. Um, yeah, I think those kind of all my, all those are all my stream of consciousness um, thoughts that you've stirred up. And I, I'm really grateful um, that I had a chance to share some of them. So love, love to hear your thoughts. Thank you, Claire. Uh, wonderful. Jason, over to you. Well, I would just say, this is exactly why this conversation is so necessary and exciting because like I forgot to mention media scholars when I rattled off the list of people who have been involved in the history communication 
discourse. But this is why it's crucial to have media scholars in the conversation and media practitioners and history communicators in the conversation because it just it touches on so many areas and you know, not to beat a dead horse, but only seeing it through an academic prism just doesn't tell the whole story, right? And as someone who has a master's himself and doesn't have a PhD, this question of who is allowed to speak has followed me my entire career. If I had a dollar for all the time that PhDs told me to stop talking, I'd never have to work again, right? And so um, this is a huge issue. And it's a huge issue that gets litigated on the social web time and time again. And I kind of track this through my book, Right. When Wikipedia came out, scholars pushed back and said, you guys don't have enough expertise to be writing Wikipedia pages. And then when Twitter came out and history and pics blew up, people, the scholars pushed back and they said, you don't have enough expertise. You don't have enough authority to be running a Twitter history account. And either this has happened time and time again, that there has been this argument in the public sphere about who should have the expertise to say what and who sh should deserve to have a certain platform. And Again, this is kind of where it gets to this question about underlying values, because the history profession, as we're sort of experience it, wants to privilege expertise. It wants to put expertise in the center of communicative power, but that is not how the web works. The web was designed to put users in the center of communicative power. And that user could be an expert or it could be a non-expert. But ultimately the goal is to get people to make transactions online and the way you get transactions online is buying a allowing users to have as frictionless a experience as possible. And of course, scholarly expertise is a very high friction endeavor, as I talk about in the book. So it sets up this clash of values. And that clash of values plays out over and over and over again on different platforms and different spaces. I kind of make an argument in the book that I think the social web has actually removed some of these gatekeeping functions and has sort of removed these linear paths of credentialism that fields like history and science and journalism and other expert-centered forms of knowledge have kind of grown up with and feel very comfortable in. And so removing that has made some in the profession, not all, but some, very uncomfortable. The fact that there can be these non-gatekept, non-credentialed people out there speaking about these topics and gaining authority makes some professional scholars and professional scientists and professional journalists very uncomfortable. And you know what? There's a lot of good reason to be uncomfortable, as I document in the book. So I don't think these debates are settled, but I think understanding the value systems at work and how they are in opposition to each other and the incentive structures is a critical piece of the conversation, as opposed to litigating particular outcomes, right? As opposed to saying this person didn't deserve a platform and this person did. There's been plenty of that conversation happening over the past 20 years. There hasn't been as much conversation about these opposing value structures at work and the incentives at work that are servicing all this stuff to us in our feeds. And that's what I hope this book makes a contribution to. I think that your questions too about where do we go from here are like, so critical, which is why I think, again, we need to have a space to talk about these things. Because I do think we have to reckon with the fact that we have all collectively contributed to this social media ecosystem that we now have. By using Twitter for 10 to 15 years, by using Facebook to 10 to 15 years, by using Instagram for 10 to 15 years, regardless of whether we felt like we had educational intent or altruistic intent or social justice intent, we have all created this universe that we are now stuck with. And we have not been particularly intentional about thinking through it and its consequences. And in the book, I talk about some of the consequences. And yes, there are some positive consequences. There are some diversity of voices and diversity of perspectives and diversity of stories that have shown through. And that's important to recognize. But there have also been some really terrible consequences. And that's important to recognize, too. And I wanted to make the point with this book that we are responsible for both. We're responsible for the good and we're responsible for the bad. And we're responsible for the bad simply by participating in the ecosystem and being part of this commercial data-driven infrastructure. And that is an uncomfortable thing to admit, uh, but I think it's an important step to thinking about how we design something better coming down the road. And to your last point, it does raise really thorny questions for history communicators and institutions. Because if you decide that you no longer want to be part of this ecosystem that Facebook has created, do you really want to walk away from your 10 million Instagram followers? Or are you so attached to them as an institution that you now feel like you're stuck with it? And even if the evidence presented in front of you clearly demonstrates that Instagram is not an effective educational tool, and it ultimately does more harm than good, 
are you prepared as a history communicator, as an institution, as a scholar, to walk away from it and move on to something else? And I think some people will say yes. And some people will be like, but it's a really great marketing tool. And that is part of the conversation that we need to be having. And hopefully the History Communication Institute can be a forum for those conversations. Great, thank you, Jason. Um, before we uh, open it up to um, our viewers, uh, Eric, I think you had a question. Yes, thanks, Christian. Uh, Jason, this is a very, very interesting conversation. And the book is just incredibly provocative. And I wish I had the next 30 minutes just to myself to talk to you about the many things that are in it, but I don't. So let me just pose one question of many that I could. Uh, and I came away from the book more pessimistic than optimistic as I think you, you came away from writing it. And so in terms of takeaways, um, I came away thinking or understanding that yes, the web is a very big place uh, and that history is a term that many people claim uh, and that it applies to a lot of very different things. And you've convinced me or rather kind of reinforced my sense that there's a, a lot of history on the web, uh, B, much of it is quite light um, or of poor quality uh, and see that there's good stuff too. And in saying this, this is not a distinction between who has the credentials and the authority because professional historians can say some really, really stupid things um, uh, out there on the, uh, on the web and on Twitter and other places. So it's not a question of credentials here, but it's what's out there. Um, so the problem is, as I read your book, is that the light and weak stuff gets audiences, clicks, and revenue, uh, and that much of the good stuff struggles to stay afloat. Uh, you rightly sing the praises of Made by History uh, in the pages of the book, but you also note that the business model is a precarious one, um, and that there's a constant kind of struggle to stay afloat, and if not for you know Katie's um, kind of missionary work in, in doing this, uh, it, it might not necessarily survive. So the question that I have is a simple one. Um, are good history initiatives financially feasible? Uh, and is there a business model out there in the web uh, that allows good history to reach audiences and stay in business? Or do the things that allow content to kind of rise to the surface and be seen by vast numbers, um, is that stuff that good and responsible history cannot consistently do? Yeah, I think this is a great question. Um, I, again, I think we can find, we can find specific examples in moments where things have worked, but it's a huge challenge because the social web as an architecture is designed to privilege transactions and lots of transactions in a short amount of time. And the more transactions in a short amount of time you can produce, the more value you create on the social web. And this is why I talk about in the book, Wikipedia versus Newpedia. So Newpedia was the version of the, of the encyclopedia before Wikipedia. And the idea with Newpedia is that it would be expert centric, that experts would review all the entries, it would be peer reviewed. And before anything got published, it would get certified by a team of advisory me board members. And the problem was it didn't produce enough transactions and it was also very expensive. It cost $250,000 to produce like you know, a dozen or so entries. And so the realization became, well, actually, if we just allow users to do this and we allow them to do it faster and we remove experts and gatekeepers, we can get more transactions in a shorter amount of time. And that actually increases the value and makes it more sustainable. And so this is why I think it's important to understand the incentives and how these things operate underneath the surface. Because if you look at where the web is heading, Things like crypto, for example, which I'm involved in and have been earshot to many conversations about crypto, it's the same logic at work. It's about transactions and the, the, the platforms are being built to be as frictionless as possible and to make as many transactions possible in a short amount of time and to get users to click and engage and spend money. And that is how those platforms are going to become valuable over time is by privileging transactions, right? So as history communication evolves, it's gonna be forced to be wedged into these infrastructures, which are continuing to operate under the same incentives. 
So can it be done? Yes. But as Katie mentioned at the beginning, it will be a very, very heavy lift. It will be a labor of love. It is going to require an inordinate amount of resources, time and attention and money to keep sustaining the number of transactions necessary to keep the machine working and keep it profitable. And this is one of the huge challenges, I think, that all this stuff faces. Not that it's good or bad, educational or not educational. It all gets wedged into this infrastructure, which has certain value systems at work. And so part of what the book is trying to argue is that we can't just make everything about these particular values that the social web offers us. There have to be things that have intrinsic value. There have to be things that have to be important, regardless of whether they generate a large number of transactions. And those things need to be funded and supported. And I hope that that's a message that we can take from this book and other work that people are doing and put out there into the, right, into the wider world. Because right now, what I see is all the money flowing into that and being taken away from a type of work that is time consuming, that is intrinsically valuable, that is expert centric, and that requires a lot of time to produce a small number of transactions. Can I add, um, sure. can I just jump in uh, to add to the conversation? Because I think it's such a great question. And that's one of the things, Eric, that jumped out to me is that, um, you know, the book kind of situates that you either have expertise um, and rigor or you kind of have these commercial impulses and that they can't connect. Um, and I actually think that there are some great examples of where you have, you know, uh, rigorous scholarship sh shaping you know, very wildly popular conversations. And I think looking at those moments where they can intersect, they, they aren't necessarily diametrically opposed and seeing what makes it work. And so I, I think about what how we have built Made by History and how we have made it work is that we're working with a commercial entity. We're working with a corporation. You know, we're working with the Washington Post. We have advertising dollars. We work with a variety of history centers and small institutes. We're working with academia and getting support that way. We're also working with um, faculty um, who are who have institutional support or reasons why that they want to write for us, even though we do not pay them, um, and that they get a benefit um, in terms of their institution or their department perhaps is rewarding and recognizing that this is an important way to spend your time and we're going to value it, however that may work out. And so I think that you, you need to see, you know, how can we combine, you know, public facing institutions, um, academic institutions, businesses, um, nonprofits, in a way to kind of build those collaborative partnerships, because it's not a huge money maker, right? So if we don't want it driven by commercial impulses, I think there's a way to kind of think about, okay, well, how can we find ways in which we all have a common agenda? We all want to get the best history and rigorous scholarship to the, the broader public. Um, and that there is an incentive for the post. Um, it does raise their profile. It gets them more viewers. It gives it kind of a rigor to some of their, um, to, to some of the analysis. But then there are also benefits in academia and in kind of nonprofits and in centers, um, academic centers as well, and professional centers. So I think identifying what are the key components, because this stuff is happening. Um, and so, you know, really identifying, you know, what makes something really successful to be both rigorous, um, you know, foreground scholars and experts, uh, but also really popular as well. Could you, Katie, uh, could you just talk for a moment about who funds Made by History and how, how sustainable it is or it isn't for the Post and for, so for those who edit it? Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, we're, we're constantly, I mean, it is a constant challenge of trying to, again, get institutional support for it, but we have been able to work with some wonderful centers. Um, uh, the LePage Center um, was, you know, as an example, we've got a variety of different um, humanities institutes and, and centers that are, um, you know, interested in getting more expertise to shaping broader public conversations. And so we have a list of really incredible um, support um, in terms of these different centers. And then some money comes from advertising revenue. Um, and then I think there's a, a push by many of us on the editorial team to have our institutions value our time and again, see it like it's, it's teaching. And so rather than you know getting a course release to do some of this work is something that we're constantly pushing our institutions to recognize this as just as valuable um, and rewarded um, in the same way um, in terms of teaching and scholarship. And so again, it's, it's a balancing act. It's, it, I think that the challenge is 
demonstrating that engagement should be valued at the same level as scholar, original scholarship and teaching. Um, but now is the time that we need historians. I, I think that the demand, uh, the, the threat that we that democracy faces demands a more informed public. Um, and it, so I think now is really the time um, that historians are eager to be involved in public engagement and finding ways to support that is um, really key too. Thank you. Uh, Christian, real quick, just if you don't mind. Uh, sure. Just, I've gotten a couple of messages about uh, finding my newsletter. So if you don't mind, I'm just gonna put it in the chat. Uh, because I'm going to put more stuff from the book that didn't make it and other stuff about this conversation in future newsletters. So I'll just put that, hopefully everyone can see that. So if you're interested, you can uh, find me there. Great, thank you. Um, again, if you'd like to join the conversation, use the raise hand function and you'll get into, uh, into the queue. I'd like to call on uh, John Martin next. Uh, Thank you, Christian, and, and thank you, thank you, Eric, and, and all these people who have asked these marvelous questions. Jason, it sounds like a marvelous book. I'm a recovering journalist, so I'm going to ask a question that I hope won't make you tear, tear your hair out, and I don't think there's much chance of that. But uh, in the course of your research, did you come across a major episode of history that either suffered terribly or was benefited greatly by e-history? Hmm. That's an interesting question. So there is actually a whole chapter in the book called The Newsworthy Past. So one thing I didn't mention, which I probably should have, the way the book is set up. So the beginning of the book kind of just introduces the general themes. The next chapter, the second chapter, talks about e-history and this clash of values that I talked about, expert-centric versus user-centric. And then the next chapters actually proceed to talk about the various mechanisms by which historical content becomes visible online. And again, that content could be created by a professional scholar or by an amateur historian or a hobbyist or anything in between. So uh, there's a chapter called the crowdsource past, which talks about how crowdsourcing can raise history to our attention. There's a chapter called nostalgia on demand, which Claire mentioned, which talks about how nostalgia uh, becomes a mechanism for getting seen on the social web. There's a chapter about virality and how history can go viral that focuses on Twitter, but also could apply to YouTube. There's a chapter called The Visual Past, which largely talks about Instagram, but also then talks about history memes. And then there's a chapter called The Newsworthy Past, and that talks about the past that can get pegged to a news cycle, right? And a great example is Ukraine. So uh, six to eight weeks ago, you probably weren't seeing a lot of history about Ukraine in your newsfeed. It probably wasn't getting surfaced to you by the algorithms and by users online. But because of the geopolitical situation currently happening right now, suddenly you might be seeing Ukraine history in your feeds a lot. So this is an example of how understanding the mechanisms behind the scenes, I think, is an important part of this media literacy question. So why was I not seeing Ukrainian history eight weeks ago? And now why am I seeing it all the time now? And the answer is because it can be pegged to the news cycle and to this large geopolitical event. So I think to your question, John, yes, there's lots of examples of the newsworthy past surfacing historical scholarship and making that relevant to people in a particular moment in time. The question that I'm left with at the end of the book, though, is how much does that stick? So we see something in our newsfeed for six to eight weeks because it's in the news or because it feels urgent, because it's tied to a particular story that's trending. And But then what happens? What is the longer term educational impact of that, to Katie's point? And I think the jury's still out on that. And I think there's lots of room for more research on that to actually understand these things. Uh, you know, but there's a lot, there's some evidence that I point to in the book, in both anecdotal and talking to people and research that's been done by Pew and others, that actually this stuff becomes kind of a flash in the pan. It shows up in people's feeds. And then over time, it recedes. And people don't remember it, or it doesn't stick, or they don't know where they saw it or it just becomes overwhelming because there's so much information that they can't actually say anything specific about it. So then it just becomes this question about awareness versus understanding. You might be aware of something, but do you understand it any better? And I think that's one of the things that I wrestle with in the book, and I think is an open sort of history communication question. Thank you. Um, Michael Novak, next. Hey, Michael.
Oh, sorry, I was muted. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Steinauer. Good to see you again. Congratulations on the book. Um, Great to see you, my friend. My question is, this is kind of a kind of a little bit of a tangent, but it's in the same vein. Um, one of the things that I think is starting to get more and more press is the influence of historically themed or based video games on people's understanding and perception of history, especially um, younger people. So I'm wondering if you've done any research on that and if you think that's going to become a bigger thing going forward, getting more people into history, because honestly, that's how I got into history. So I was wondering your thoughts on that. That is a great question. Uh, I'll put in a little plug. So in two weeks, I'm actually going to be on a panel at the National World War II Museum, it'll be virtual, talking about history of video games. And it'll be a panel with Robert Whitaker, who some of you probably know, he does... Um, History Respawn on YouTube, but then also two game designers uh, from two video game companies. And then we've also put in a panel on this for the International Federation of Public History in August in Berlin, which we hope will get accepted. I think this is a critical question to examine. I don't touch on it too much in the book, but I think it's a huge area for us to look into moving forward when we think about history communication because you are absolutely right. More people play video games than watch the Super Bowl, than read the New York Times and the Post combined, than use Twitter. It's a huge, huge element of the e-history universe. And I have lots of questions about it. Uh, and one of my questions, again, talking about the larger ecosystem, is uh, what are video games <laughs> actually doing to young people in the terms of like their attention and their, you know, how they spend their time. I mean, we hear reports about people spending 10, 12, 15 hours a day playing video games. And, you know, I just have lots of questions about that, whether it's a history video game or whether it's another type of video game. Also, again, these games are designed to be addictive. They're designed to keep you on the platform. And as they move into things like Roblox and Metaverse, they're designed to keep you on the platform, to spend money, to have virtual tokens and virtual currencies that you will use in these platforms in order to drive revenue for the companies which are public and want to get their share price up. So all of that infrastructure informs these history of video games. These are not solely educational exercises. These are commercial for-profit enterprises which are designed to keep you addicted to the platform and continually using the platform in lots of very clever ways. So... I don't have a good answer to your question yet, but it's something I'm really curious to learn more about and talk with some of these experts in the field about. And I think this is an area that we in the History Communication Institute can put out some interesting research on to see what type of effect these games are having, not just on the broader public, but also if they are in fact a gateway to historical <clears throat> understanding or not. Go ahead, yeah. And if I, sorry, I couldn't unmute. Um, if I might add just, I, I totally, a billion percent agree, Jason. And I also think, uh, you know, there's also films and TV series made off of video games that get removed from the gameplay that is sort of obviously anachronistic and move into a narrative. And then that it, uh, so part of that multi-story experience is getting extrapolated even more. Thank you. Um, a question from, or, or yeah, a question from Julian Ryman. He, uh, writes, incredible discussion, exclamation point. What do you all think about the role of history communication slash digital marketing slash business strategy in bringing more money into the historical profession? When historians seek profit, they're often painted as enemies of true hard-hitting historical research, but with, with humanities departments losing funding across the US at an accelerating rate, might there be room to merge the profit-oriented digital space with truth-oriented research in order to bring more cash and popularity to history scholars? It's to all of you. Yeah, well, I think that's a great question. Um, so this is one of the reasons why I have my own cryptocurrency. Um, I think we need to infuse more money into the history profession and particularly into the field of history communication, which currently it's, I mean, there's no place that funds really history communication work, right? I mean, Katie has been doing this amazing work trying to fundraise for Made by History, but it's really, really hard, right? You know, the National Endowment for the Humanities doesn't give out history communication grants. The Mellon Foundation doesn't write huge checks for this type of work at the moment. And a lot of departments don't have extra money lying around as we've cited because their budgets have been cut. And museums certainly don't have a lot of extra money lying around because their budgets have been cut. So where is the funding gonna come from 
to support this type of work, both the research aspect of it and the production of it and the thinking that is needed to be critical about all these things. So that's where the cryptocurrency comes in. So through the History Communication Institute, we are hoping to use cryptocurrency as a way to fund history communication work and research. So the idea is if you want to launch a new history communication project, whether it be a podcast or a YouTube video series or a metaverse project, you could apply to the History Communication Institute for funds and we would reward those funds in cryptocurrency. And we can also fund research into these things so that if you, like Claire and I, have questions about video games and what effect they're really having on historical understanding, history communication, we might be able to give you a grant in crypto to work on that. So um, I see a place for it. But of course, I also come from a different spot, right? I grew up in the public history world. I grew up in museums and for-profit institutions that needed to bring in revenue every year in order to exist. And uh, you know, I worked as a consultant for several years where I was making a profit, and I currently work in a consulting capacity where I'm also making a profit. So to me, the, the idea of bridging this world of commercial with educational and scholarly is not like so forbidden. And, uh, you know, I'm not afraid to use some of the tools that are out there if it helps the profession and it helps the field and it helps, helps advance our work. But I recognize that there are different viewpoints on this, depending on where people sit. I think this is a, a good conversation to have. Yeah, I would just follow up by saying that I think that there are financial structures that are in place in academia, um, in professional organizations um, for historians that can help do this work. Um, and, and I think part of the challenge is you know, convincing administrators and convincing figures um, within, within and outside of academia that investing in this type of work is going to be good for the humanities. It's going to help us grow the liberal arts, to make the liberal arts more accessible to students, that if they encounter it when they're earlier, when they're younger, then maybe they're going to be more inclined to take history classes when they're in college. And so I think, you know, my, my response to that is, you know, we, there, there are a lot of, institutional supports um, for growing the humanities within academia, within professional organizations, and taking some of recognizing that public engagement is a worthy endeavor to, to fund doing podcasts. That's not a distraction from your scholarly output, that that is something that is equally valuable, that if you create a podcast that is incredibly like a journal article, but presented in a different format that needs to be valued and encouraged the same way, because it has, um, it can reverberate in a lot of ways um, that, you know, we don't even know um, because the research isn't there, but we know that it can connect to broader audiences that can then help you know, grow the, the mission of liberal arts colleges, of university presses, of professional organizations, and all of these other institutions that are out there um, that, you know, again, are invested in this question of getting the humanities and humanities research um, out to the broader public to encourage this critical historical thinking. Thanks, Katie. I wonder if you could just talk for a moment about your own experience um, at Purdue. I, I know you've you fought that battle, and I'd love to just hear how how um, um, what your experience has been, and maybe you've got advice, sort of at a very concrete, specific level, to uh, to others uh, um, uh, in this in this field. Yeah, it's a challenge. Uh, I, I won't sugarcoat it. I, I'd love to say that, oh, it's very clear, you know, I have 100% um, support for um, my work all in all capacities that I want. But I think the challenge is, um, you know, Purdue does have a terrific office of engagement. And I think the challenge um, for anyone who's really interested in doing this work is finding the, the areas of your institution, the individuals um, that are also really committed to these ideas. You know, some, some people engagement may not be something that um, is really, um, that they're really passionate about, but there are people on, on your campus, whether it's through your college or more broadly um, through other colleges on campuses that are really committed to, to thinking about the societal impact of research and thinking about bridging these divides. And so, for me, I've been able to, you know, find support through places like the Purdue Policy Research Institute, um, which is not part of liberal arts, um, is, is beyond it, but I've formed a really great partnership um, with them. And so, again, it's, I think this is part of the challenge that Jason has kind of um, alluded to, is that 
all of this tremendous work is happening. Um, uh, there are all of these people and institutions and organizations who want to see the same end goal. And so it's trying to build a community, trying to build networks so that you can support one another um, in doing that. And that's been what I've tried to do, um, both in our work with Made by History, um, but, you know, in and doing it here at Purdue as well to, again, finding ways in which, you know, and then documenting. I'd also add like my big piece of advice for anyone interested in doing um, a public engagement is to document, document, document. And, and that's actually one of the great things that you can show your reach in a way that a lot of times uh, history of professors or faculty struggle to say, oh, this number of people um, read my piece. Well, you can do that when you write an op-ed. You can do that. You can trace downloads. You can trace, you know, emails that you get from the broader public to show your impact. And that was something I was able to integrate in my tenure portfolio when I went up for tenure. Um, and that I've continued to do to kind of prove to administrators that this is important work and you need to invest in this work. Thank you. Um, Bill um, McAllister had his... add one more thought about that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Based. Sorry, Claire. No, no, no. Just from a mission-based organization, I think we usually think of social media as a place where we can garner young people um, and sort of cultivate lifelong members and donors and things like that. But um, the age on Facebook, it, the, the prominent ages on Facebook are now in the 50s, 60s, even 70s. And so we're actually speaking to directly to our current donor base and member base. Um, and that's going to continue to happen on all of our platforms. Um, Instagram is now more in the 25 to 40 range. And so as new platforms get created, we're creating new places for all these different um, funders generationally. Great. Thank you. Um, let me, be, we're, we're almost out of time, but let me get real quickly uh, two, two folks. Uh, um, well, now it's just one folks. Um, Jean McCacken just uh, Jean Atkins and Bill McAllister. Um, um, let's go uh, with with Jean first. Jean Atkins, could you please unmute yourself and ask your question? And then I'll call on Bill uh, McAllister, and then we'll see if there's time to answer these questions. Jean. Thank you. Thank you so much for such an engaging and important discussion. Um, I was wondering if uh, Catherine or Jason or any of the speakers could speak to the problem that Tom Nichols raises in his book, How America Lost Faith in Expertise and Why That's a Giant Problem. Uh, Tom Nichols, the professor at the US War, War College, um, he raises this as more of a cultural, not just a social media uh, uh, problem to be addressed, but also a, a cultural problem and that perhaps the social media is amplifying this sort of uh, lack of, uh, well, a changing understanding of what an expert is. And then uh, the social media is actually compounding that self-perpetuating, you know, these silos of confirmation bias. Thank you so much for uh, this opportunity. Thank you. And uh, William McAllister, if you could please unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself. Okay. Okay. I'll make it real fast. Um, please. I worked for almost 20 years at the historian's office at the State Department, and we did kind of both retail and wholesale history. And one of the questions we got all the time, and I'm curious, if, I expect all three of the panelists ran into this, and I found this kind of frustrating was the issue of first. Who was the first person who did this? When was this the first time of that? And I became, that was a very big interest within the Department of State and, and among the general public that we dealt with as well. And I always found that really problematic because it was kind of trivializing and it often really made it hard to sort of give an answer that was really valid and useful. So if you have any, it, I think that's a sub-phenomenon of this. If you have any comment on that, I'd be happy to hear it. All righty, thanks so much, Bill. Uh, 30 seconds each. Uh, who wants to start? Jason, I'll put you on the spot. Well, to both of you, I'd say you should definitely read my book because a lot of stuff in the book relates directly to those questions. Uh, I will say Tom Nichols' book does get a mention in my book. Um, I think uh, this question about expert-centric versus user-centric, right, is sort of at the heart of this question. And does the expert reside at the center of communicative power or not? And I talk about all the ways in my book that the social web was not architected to do that. 
And so this is something that experts have continually written about in the public sphere, is how they wish that the public sphere would privilege experts more. But unfortunately, the social web was not built that way. So read the book. There's more about it there. Uh, in terms of the question about, First. yeah, to me, uh, Bill, this question sort of, again, resonates with something I write in the book, which is that e-history promises to be instantly gratifying. And so that is standing in opposition to this sort of always evolving intellectual pursuit that historians kind of see scholarship as. And so e-history promises to be able to tell you who was the first or what happened on this day. And that is one of the ways that it gets surfaced online is if it can deliver that sort of instantly gratifying answer. Because again, that's how the web has been architected. And so I argue in the book that the more e-history proliferates and answers these questions for people, the more it actually reinforces the people asking those questions and those value structures at work. And so this is one of the core essence, core themes of the book as it, as it unfolds. Thank you. Claire, um, any reactions to the question? Yeah. Well, William, thanks for your question. Also, my father was both an American history professor and a foreign service officer for 40 years. So I, uh, it's good to know what was going, what was a question at the state department. I'll have to tell him this. Um, on the social media side, it's always, a, it's always complicated. We run into this with artists' birthdays as though um, Van Gogh's birthday is the, the information that we need to know the most about him. Um, it's the same type of thing with on this day. We try our hardest to use that thing that people love as an entry point and then move off book so that if that's what's getting you here, fine, but let's move you away from that as quickly as we can to something that's more valuable. Um, it's both playing into that question and then ho hopefully trying to break it down or to use Jason's word, disrupt it, you know, a little bit. Thank you. Really hard. Katie? Katie? I'll just end um, by answering the question about expertise. It's something I think about a lot. And as a political historian, I would emphasize that it's a political development. Um, and that, you know, th there has been an assault, a political assault on expertise, but also a need to reimagine who can be an expert um, that, that broadens uh, the, the conversation that allows more perspectives um, to come in that is not so elite white and male. Um, but so I think that, you know, challenging expertise can be is really significant to bringing in new voices. But I think there also um, can be a way in which the challenge to expertise can be, you know, motivated by um, your partisanship or business interest. And expertise is important, uh, but so is a reimagining of who has those credentials um, and who has um, expertise. So making it more inclusive. Uh, but I think that that's a really important challenge as we think about some of the political crises that we're facing today. Thank you so much. Uh, you three have managed to do something that I almost didn't think was possible. That is to uh, take my mind off uh, the uh, Russian invasion of, po of, of, of Ukraine that um, uh, uh, has, has depressed me for the past week. Um, thank you for just this amazing conversation. Uh, and um, final words go to Eric. Thank you, Christian, and thank you, Jason, Claire, and Katie. Uh, and I, too, had my mind taken off ever so briefly the world events that are disturbing us so, so, so gravely. Please join us next Monday, March 14th at 4 p.m. when the Washington History Seminar returns for a session on a just-published book by Leon Fink entitled Undoing the Liberal World Order. Progressive Ideals and Political Realities Since World War II, with discussants Jeremy Edelman and Kimberly Philip Fine. We hope to see you all next week. Till then, take care, be safe. Good night. <laughs>